All right. Well, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, all month long, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is celebrating space exploration, especially this week. This week, we are wrapping up World Space Week. So we've been talking to scientists. We've been talking to engineers. We've been talking to astronauts. Uh, all kinds of amazing people around the world who are studying the Earth from above, who are leaving the planet, who are studying our solar system and beyond. So it's been a lot of fun this week uh, having all of these live events. Today's event is a really great one. We are connecting with Taryn Tomlinson. She has spent her career committed to discovering and exploring space. She holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from McGill University and a master's degree in space science from the University of California in San Diego. So since 2012, she's been a senior engineer at the Canadian Space Agency, working on space robotics, satellites, and many more exciting space projects. And today, Taryn's gonna to talk to us about satellites, satellites that are looking back down, making observations of our planet. And we're gonna learn a little bit more how they are impacting our everyday life in lots of ways we probably haven't even thought of before. So here we go. Here is Taryn. Hi, Taryn. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Good, good. Well, it's great to have you joining us live today. Um, it's a beautiful fall day, so it's great to have a group of classrooms tuning in live via YouTube, tuning in live via Facebook, and of course, we've got a great group who are live with us uh, in different locations, so we're going to steal some of their questions soon. Great, great to hear it. Happy World Space Week, and I'm really happy to be exploring by the scene of my pants today with all of you. We're going to talk about satellites today. Space is my favorite subject, and uh, satellites is something that I want you all to be thinking about for the next 15 minutes. Um, so my name is Taryn Tomlinson, and I'm an engineer at Canadian Space Agency. A special shout out to Cortland Park. My kids went to Cortland Park, and I've been to your school so many times talking about space. Um, you're just down the street from us at the Space Agency. Also a shout out to all of you across Canada who are tuning in. Um, thanks to Joe and to our communications department, Alice, who's online supporting this. But thanks to all of you, because you're here, you're engaging, you're going to ask questions, and we're going to start by engaging you right up front. So teachers, get ready in the chat box. Before we get started, I want you all to think about, shout out, or write down one word, one word, when you think about satellites. So one word. And the teachers can type those words into the chat, and I'm going to ask Joe to start reading them off. But when I say satellites, think of a word. I want to know in 15 or 20 minutes if that word changes. And this is really a fun little experiment we're going to do. We're scientists. All right. So those tuning in via Facebook or YouTube, it's a little bit slower. It's going to be a 10-second delay, so I'll give you some time to type in. But we're already getting stuff from our teachers. We're getting space. We're getting GPS, internet, Wi-Fi. Internet came up again. Um, orbit. So those are some of the words coming in. A loon is coming in as well. So those are some of the words that are coming in uh, from our live group. Space, technology, interesting. Well, that's good. Pick the right talk then. So Matt. I love it. So Yeah, keep going, keep going. Yeah, the last one that just came in was map. Um, and, oh, sickness. Hmm, maybe measuring the health oh, of no, the That's good. That's coming up. And I'm surprised somebody got that before I said it. That's really good. I that's that's interesting. Um, I often get you know GPS and our telephones and it's normal. We often think about uh, telecommunications and television for satellites. And what I want to do today is to get that list in your mind just going with so many things you never expected that satellites are doing for you every single day. So without further ado, I'll get started and we're going to do that experiment at the end and I'm going to see if your word changed. What I really want is to show you how satellites are part of your everyday life in more ways than you can imagine. So to get started, Joe, let's show them a video. The endangered North Atlantic right whale is an iconic marine mammal. The Wrong run, Joe. Canada... The other one first. <laughs> All good. Oh, okay. Start with the introduction. Give me a second to cue up the other one. Oh, it's my pleasure to give you an introduction. So what I want to talk about with this video will be we have an incredible vantage point with satellites from above. So while you're watching this video, 
Put yourself, explore by the seat of your pants. Put yourself in the satellite. Look down and imagine all you can do. And then after, I'm going to tell you all sorts of things that make satellites so powerful, the most powerful tools that we have on the planet, in my opinion. Go ahead, Joe, if you're ready. If you want another couple of seconds. Afterwards, I'm going to be showing you all sorts of images from above. And those images that you're going to see in this video right now with David Saint-Jacques, who's going to talk to you about while he's up in space station, which is a satellite as well. He's up in space station and he's taking incredible photos from above. But satellites do more than just photos. And Joe, I can see that you're ready. Go ahead and press play. I'm not hearing the audio, Joe. Sorry, Karen, uh, that didn't queue up properly. Um, we can try one more time if you want. I would love to. It's just a minute. I can make everything else shorter. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, we want to hear that audio. Okay, let me know if it's better now. Thanks. While looking at Earth from space, Canadian Space Agency astronaut David Saint-Jacques was amazed by the beauty of our planet. He called Earth humanity's spacecraft. Earth is keeping billions of people alive and billions of animals and billions of plants alive in the deadly vacuum of space. So we are all astronauts and our main spacecraft is, is Mother Earth. And we are responsible to keep Earth in good shape. And we can find solutions. And when we work together, we can accomplish miracles. That gives me a lot of hope for the future. Great, thank you. I, I think it's done. I have, a, I have some audio problems or I'm having some problems, Joe. Is it done? Um, I'm gonna try one more thing here. While looking at Earth from space. I think we have everything now. Space Agency astronaut David Saint-Jacques was amazed by the beauty of our planet. He called Earth humanity's spacecraft. Earth is keeping billions of people alive and billions of animals and billions of plants alive in the deadly vacuum of space. So we are all astronauts and our main spacecraft is, is Mother Earth. And we are responsible to keep Earth in good shape. And we can find solutions. When we work together, we can accomplish miracles and things that we thought were impossible. That gives me a lot of hope for the future. Earth imagery from space helps us better understand the science of our planet and find solutions to protect our environment. Wonderful, we did it. And sometimes we don't get things on the first try, but uh, we always try again. This image that you see right now was taken by David St. Jacques from the International Space Station. Do you see Vancouver Island right there in the middle of the picture? Well, this is an incredible picture because I, it gets to help me describe to you how satellites help us. I'm from Vancouver Island. Often I go hiking. In the middle of Vancouver Island, you'll see a bunch of mountains with the white snow. Before I go hiking, I check the weather. Thank you, satellites. I check my maps. Thank you, satellites. And one of you said maps out there. While I'm hiking, I use my GPS that one of you mentioned and I make sure that I'm always safe and that I can always find my way back. Satellites are involved in things that we do every single day. Let's meet a few of the satellites. If there's one thing I want you to go home with at the end of today, I want you to talk about some of the Canadian satellites. And those are the ones that are all around the planet Earth on the bottom. The three over on the left, I call the three little sisters or the triplets. 
They're, the radar site constellation mission, they're only one year old. Those three were launched last year. They have superpowers. All of these satellites have superpowers. And you can always ask an engineer, what's the superpower of that satellite? Well, those three Canadian radar sat satellites have the superpower that they send out a radar signal and they wait for it to rebound. And when that signal comes back, they can make a 3D map of mountains, of oceans, of the coastlines, of just about anything, all the way down to really high resolution, right down to your school if, they, if we want to. It can do it through clouds, through rain, all night, all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Those satellites are working for you all the time and they're above your head right now. Now I say they're just one year old and they're the three little sisters. Why did I say that? Because to the right, RadarSat 2 is like the big brother. RadarSat 2 was launched in 2007. So he is 13 years old, still doing excellent mapping work with that same superpower, bouncing and, and picking back up those waves and doing 3D maps. Canada is very, very good at a technology called synthetic aperture radar. But if you go home tonight, I want you to be able to say to your parents, there are these three little satellites that Canada launched called the RadarSat satellites, and they have superpowers. On the right, we see SciSat. SciSat is a satellite that's actually the oldest one we have, 17 years old now, launched in 2003. Looking around in the atmosphere around it, monitoring the changes for the climate, monitoring molecules in up in the atmosphere to help protect us and help us monitor the changing planet. The, the satellites that are up above, they're not actually smaller in real life, they're just as big, they're all about the same size. Those are international expeditions that we're doing where Canada puts an instrument on board, let's say, a NASA satellite or a satellite with the European partners or our partners with uh, France or with, with Japan. And they're equally important. They're doing incredible things. I'll talk about one of them. The second one says SWAT 2022. Well, SWAT's not yet born. SWAT's not yet launched. That will be in two years. SWAT is going to map all the oceans, all the waters and lakes, rivers of the entire planet. We don't actually have all those maps. They're not accurate. We don't have everything. It's so hard to get all that detail unless you use a satellite. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my presentation not talking anymore about the, the satellites themselves, but what the satellites see when they look down. And we're going to talk about how we all benefit every day from what our satellites do. When it comes to climate change and we talk about that, what comes into your mind? I think of a photo like this. This photo is not taken by a satellite. I think about factories and pollution. Um, we all need to do our part to help save the climate uh, and, to, and to reverse climate change. But how can we look at places that are difficult to access? How can we look at our mountains or up in the Arctic? And how can we see all of these factories all at the same time? How do we do that? Satellites can do that. With satellites, we can see the big picture of our land. We can see the waters, the atmosphere, and how they interact and change over time. We can see the, the planet's past, the present, and the future. It helps us understand and adapt to climate change. We've been observing our, our country for over two decades with those radar sat satellites. We're looking at climate change impacts and the ice dynamics, air pollution and ozone depletion. And something about, I'm about to teach you about is coastal erosion. Imagine you take your finger and you go all the way around Canada here. This is Canada that's all colorful in this image. And this image was taken by RadarSat. And you think, what's happening along the coastlines that's so important? Let me tell you, coastal erosion is happening because our ice is melting up north and rising sea levels are causing the, the coastline to erode. Those are impacts of climate change. Monitoring the changes to our, co our coast is really, really important. We have the longest coastline in the entire world, the country with the longest coastline, and it's home to unique biodiversity and resources. And when I think about what's important to keep coastlines and land stable, I think about humans and their houses that are built along coastlines. And I think about animal species and how it impacts their lives. 
Can you think of an animal whose life is very much impacted by the changing ground underneath them? I'm thinking about polar bears. And it is absolutely critical that we help support their habitats and their lives by being able to measure their changing grounds. Polar bears need the thickness of the ice in order to do their hunting. And we're all aware that the changing ice melt up north is affecting them greatly. Let's talk about satellites having impact over the food that we eat. Imagine you're a farmer and you have this very large field in front of you. This isn't a satellite image, of course. This is a picture of a farmer looking at his or her field. It's a very large field. How do you know if there's a part of your field that needs more water or another part that needs more fertilizer? You probably need some really powerful tools. Well, using applications to analyze data, using data from space, farmers know more about the moisture of their crops, the health of their crops, and they can make better decisions. Whether they put more water out there, whether they maybe don't need more fertilizer, and it helps both their operations and the environment at the same time. And one of you said sickness and health. Satellites help us stay healthy. We can't see viruses and bacteria that cause disease from satellites, but we can see conditions that are changing around our habitat. So for example, land humidity, land cover, air pollution, those all contribute to our health. And some of those things lead to health problems, such as infectious diseases. And let's look at this picture. Here's another one about keeping ourselves healthy. We want diseases to be under control and mitigated. It's really important to use satellites to look at something that we call vector-borne disease or diseases that move in directions, let's say, move from the south up towards the north. Have you ever heard about ticks that cause Lyme disease? Well, ticks used to not be present in Canada, and they are now. And we're able to look at the changing um, ecosystems, and we know when a certain forest will be uh, uh, supporting the kind of conditions where ticks will move into that forest. So you probably didn't know that, and it was very news to me as well over the last few years, the advancements we've been making on being able to do this. One more example is during the Ebola epidemic in Africa um, a number of years ago, we were able to help locate roads in areas so that we could help mitigate risk and support services and emergency services as they went out to help set up hospitals and infrastructure to respond. This is a, a whole slide about natural disasters. And this is a hurricane. This one's called Matthew. Satellites help us keep safe during natural disasters. Floods, earthquakes, wildfires, high hurricanes. We can help fight all of these with all sorts of superpowers of the, the satellites. We can also help firefighters and paramedics to use information to find roads and to identify areas that are being affected, find the fastest routes to save lives. Some of you re might remember floods that happened here in 2011, or maybe you're too young, but they happened right here in the Richelieu behind my house. Montreal had a lot of problems in 2017 and 19, and satellites helped play a critical role. Radar sat that I talked about has been used for monitoring and identifying areas that are affected and how serious the damages are. We are able to quickly deploy rescue teams with satellite data. A quick story, Michael Stokes is a captain in the Great North and he transports foods to Northern communities. He creates ice maps. So one of you said maps, ice maps are created so that we can move the, and navigate boats through the Arctic so that we can make quick decisions and that the boats don't get jammed in ice. And here's what the boats look like when they navigate up in the Arctic. And satellites help us so that we can navigate millions of lakes and rivers. How do we do it so that we're safe? Well, as you saw in the story with Captain Michael Stokes, satellites help us by telling us where the safest routes are and whether that water where we are packed with ice or whether there are routes that we can take that are navigable so that ships can, uh, can navigate without risk of crashing. 
And it doesn't stop there. Satellites keep our oceans clean. RCM, the radar sat constellation, can detect oil spills and other pollution events in Can Canadian waters. This information helps organizations respond quickly and they contain and they mitigate and they clean up those, those oil spills that reduces impacts on the health for marine life, birds and mammals. And speaking of mammals, we are currently trying to support and help the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to protect whales. And so let's queue up another video, Joe, and let's show them how we're protecting whales right now with satellite data. The endangered North Atlantic right whale is an iconic marine mammal. The Government of Canada continues to take action to help protect North Atlantic right whales and is now turning to space for innovative solutions to better detect, monitor, and predict their movements. Observing Earth from space provides critical information that helps protect our ecosystems and wildlife. Space-based solutions have the potential to help shape a better future for the North Atlantic right whale. Thank you, Joe. That was my last story and I'm on to my summary slide. Satellites are not just useful to get us the internet and help with communications with our family and friends. They're great for that, but they're also so important as they orbit the earth. They help us in many ways, as you just saw. The information that they send back helps improve our lives every day. In the future, they'll, able to be, they'll be able to do even more. If we combine information from satellites with artificial intelligence or powerful computing, we could go as far as predicting natural disasters before they happen. And we can potentially mitigate their consequences more quickly. We could also create powerful and detailed maps, even better than the ones we have today, maybe really three-dimensional ones. And we would like to use those maps to do things like helping us protect our endangered species so that we know where we are and then we can better protect them. That's why it's so important to keep developing creative and innovative technologies. Not only do they improve our lives today, but they'll help us find solutions for future challenges. And speaking of the future, we need people like you, people interested in space and science and technology to keep working on these technologies that improve lives for Canadians every day. If you're interested in satellites and benefits to our planet, well, keep asking questions. And I'm gonna ask for your questions in just a moment. So think about what you wanna ask me. Keep thinking about great, interesting ways of doing things differently and help us improve life on Earth. Who knows, maybe one day you'll also have an exciting career in space. And finally, if you enjoyed learning about Canadian satellites, come on to our CSA website and check out the fun games and activities that we have for you. We have links that are provided in this video's description and you can go in. And here you could do a mission on agriculture and help a farmer, exactly what I said, put the water in the right spots on the land or help with flooding or a mission in the Arctic to help navigate through those icy waters. You can do that using actual RCM data on our website by playing this game. So I'd like to revisit what we did right at the beginning. I want another word from you. And I wanna know maybe we'll see words that are different. So start producing some more words and get your questions formulated. And Joe's gonna help me right now to read those words back out. Thank you so much for listening, listening everybody. All right. Awesome. Well, great presentation, uh, Taryn. Uh, you've definitely convinced me satellites are doing a lot up there that we don't even think about uh, every single day. So they do quite a bit for us. And I love what you said about future careers. There are so many careers uh, in space exploration outside of just going to the moon. You know, there's so much we can learn from looking yes. back at our planet from above. Very cool. Okay, so those tuning in via YouTube or Facebook, feel free to send in some new words. Yeah, if there's no words yet, I'll just mention that if any of you want to see satellites, walk out when it's dark out, look up. And if you see something moving, it looks like a star that's moving. Well, it's a satellite. When I was your age, there were very few, but now there are thousands. So look up in the sky when it's dark. All right. Uh, well, there seems to be a theme coming with the words so far. Helper, helping. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. We want you to 
bring home that message and say, there's these satellites up there. They have superpowers and they're helping us. Yeah, galaxy, observation, uh, saving, protecting, habitats. Yeah. Yeah, so different words coming in. So I think they definitely picked up. There was uh, no raw, right or wrong answer, of course. It's just food, pollution. We want, you to, we want to open your mind and think about new perspectives. Farmers. Yeah. Farmers, photos. All right, very cool. Um, so great, I can already see some questions starting to come in via YouTube. Uh, so keep those questions coming. Let's start meeting some of our live groups and give them a chance to ask uh, some questions. So let's see, let's bring in a first group here. We'll put Junav in Guelph on the spot. We have Fix is hanging out with us. Hey, hey Junav. Hey, hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> uh, they had two questions, I'll ask them for them. Um, number one, um, what is Dextra? Because we read a bit about you and your, I know it's not related specifically to what we're talking about. And the other question is, where do you live and work? They want to know that. Ah, right. super. I'm happy to answer both. Dexter is the name of sort of a humanoid robot that went up on space station in 2008. So most of you, if you look on the back of your $5 bill, you're going to see the Canada arm, which everybody can name this 17 meter long arm. And in 2008, we sent up Dexter and Dexter kind of looks like a giant guy with really big shoulders, but it's robot. And Canada picks up Dexter by the head and Dexter goes around space station and does tons of work, tons of dexterous work. And I want to call the space station a satellite looking down on earth. Dexter also has some vision systems that are new and able to look down and do some really interesting um, observation from the sky as well. So I work very, very hard on helping Dexter get launched. And now that I work on the satellite side of the Canadian Space Agency, it's really the two different things that we do. One side of our space agency looks out and does space exploration out towards the sky and works on robots. The other part of our space, this Canadian Space Agency looks down on Earth with satellites to protect the planet. So if you think about what we do, we look up and we look down. Where do I live and work? Well, I was born on Vancouver Island and when I was your age, I just loved the stars. And I used to think, what could I do in life that would let me work in space? And uh, at the time, Julie Payette was a brand new astronaut. And she said that she studied electrical engineering at McGill University. So that's what I went and did. I now live right beside the Canadian Space Agency in St. Bruno, Saint, the space agencies in St. Hubert. I'm in St. Bruno, right by Cortland Park. There's two classrooms on right now from Cortland Park. And this is where I live because this is where I get to do all this incredible work at the Canadian Space Agency. Does that answer the question? All right, I think so. Very cool. So we're going to go to another classroom now. This time we're going to go to Mrs. Burns' class there in Sterling, Ontario. Let's bring them in. There they are. Um, what do you think is the most important satellite to us? Oh, wow, that's a hard question. It's a hard question. It's like having all these superheroes out there and then having to pick the best superhero. Wow, that's tough. I suppose I'm pretty proud of the three little sisters, the RCM, the Radarsat Constellation Mission. It's only a year old, but it's supporting 61 services to Canadians. So every day, government is supporting you and farmers and fisheries and oceans and whales and the North and, and captains on their ships, 61 services every single day for Canadians. So if I had to talk about one, the most, I suppose I would talk about our new little Canadian satellites, the Radar Sat Constellation satellites. Thanks for that question, but so hard to answer. I'd like you to go out and find one for yourself. You can go on the, uh, our website and you can see all sorts of satellites that we've been involved in and you could pick one for yourself. All right, very cool. Actually, one thing I saw online, because uh, we had some, some chats earlier in the week, uh, was a classroom who had uh, like an earth and then they were making little radar sat satellites to put around it. So they were kind of hanging them above. The oh, yeah, sort of like you, you have an image in the background right there and it shows the little radar sat satellites and they're kind of going around. That's cool. Very cool. All right, uh, got some great sixes here in Ontario, Mr. Bahala's group. Yep. Over there. there they are. Hi. Read your question. Hey, read your question. Um, in the future, do you see yourself in space? 
So the question is, in the future, do you see yourself going up in space? Ah, oh, that's such a great question. When I was your age, I really, really wanted to be an astronaut. But you may or may not know that the Canadian Space Agency recruits astronauts. Well, about every 15 years, they pick two, maybe a few more. So I've applied, but I didn't have that great chance of becoming an astronaut. On the other hand, we see in the news a lot right now that companies like SpaceX and Boeing and Orbital Sciences, they plan to send tourists into space. So it's at Virgin Galactic as well. So if I want to save my money and I want to buy a ticket, one day that's going to be possible to go into space as a space tourist so that there were multiple avenues to get to space, not just through uh, being an astronaut. But to be honest with you, when I work on space technology and it gets launched into space, I sort of feel like I'm there. When I work on satellites and I see what the satellite sees, I think, well, space is a pretty hostile place to be. It's hard to survive in space. Maybe it's better that I get to see what the satellites see and I get that experience, but I don't risk my life going up into space. Um, my little robot, Dexter, that was launched in 2008, I feel in a way like I'm up there with him because we follow his operations. And so there's, I feel so connected to what we do in space that I'm not sure I really need to go there now. Thanks for that question. Okay. I want to do a little experiment here with the classrooms that we have joining us live because we know your answer. And if I had the opportunity to go to the space station, I would go in a heartbeat. Uh, but let's, I'm going to bring our classrooms in here. Let's see a show of hands. How many students, if they had a chance to visit the space station, would do that? How many would go? I guess hands, pretty much everybody's hands in every class. I would just say no. Some people are like, why would I want to go up in a team can? <laughs> All right, very cool. So let's go to, uh, we have a couple classrooms joining us from Cortland Park. Uh, let's start with Madame Melanie's group. Let's bring them in. Oh, Madame, can you unmute for me? Perfect. So my question is, uh, how many uh, years does it take to do a satellite? How many years does it take to build? Yeah, satellite. Oh boy, wow, that's a tough question because, well, it takes a long time. Because right now, um, we're talking a lot about future satellites. For example, we're talking about when we want to build to fight wildfires. And the technology, which the superpower of that is going to be an infrared sensor, it's going to detect heat. And we've been developing that sensor in Canada for more than 10 years. And it's only good enough that it could be as high as a satellite. If you took that technology and you got it near well, uh, a wildfire, there's no problem if you're close. But if you want to put it up on a satellite, it's got to be able to detect from far, far away the heat, the heat coming from the wildfires. But we're there. Now that now the technology seems ready. So it's taken 10 years to get that ready. Now we need to build everything around it so it can fly in space. And that's going to take five or six years. So it's older than you. It takes longer than you to build this, how old you are. It takes longer than from the time you were already born to actually get those built and get those launched. And a lot of times right before we're ready for launch, we find something that we think is going to be a failure once it's up in the sky. And we know we need to fix it before it goes. You can't fix them once they're in space. Although when you're older, you're going to help us discover how to fix satellites in space so that we can repair them up there. But right now we can't do that. So we need to repair them on the ground before they go. Thank you so much for that question. Okay, I'm gonna grab a question here from YouTube. This is Mrs. McCartney's class. And Alexander is wondering, um, do the satellites move at different speeds or is there kind of an average for how long it takes a satellite to do an orbit? Yeah, that's really a good question. Um, the speed of the International Space Station is really always what I start with. The International Space Station, travels at 25,000 kilometers an hour. That's like adding a lot of zeros onto the speed of your car, right? Um, so most of the satellites that are orbiting around the Earth are going to go around that speed. However, if you go and put the satellites much, much, much higher, it depends on if you want them to just hover up above the planet or if you need them orbiting. So there's all sorts of different speeds of satellites depending on the altitude 
that you put your satellite at. And one more interesting fact, this International Space Station goes around our planet 16 times a day. That means 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day when you're living on the space station, which is pretty cool. But for a satellite, we think about it as painting the planet. So when the satellite goes across a spot, you're thinking about it's painting, it's painting, it's painting the planet underneath it. And you wanna cover everything if you can. So the faster that you're going around, if it's not too fast for your little sensor, faster you're going around, the better. So you can paint the whole planet in a faster time. Thanks for that question. And I want to point out, Joe, that there's also things in the chat, like somebody wants to show me their radar sat constellation mission model, which I'd love to see. All right. We will definitely do that. But I'm going to bring in Cortland Park first, and then we'll go back and we'll take a look at that model. So let me bring in our other class from Cortland Park. There they are. Hey, everyone. Hi. I have a question. I have two. How long does it take to make a satellite? Oh, I see that the one too. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and how many satellites are in the? How many satellites are in the sky right now? Yeah, buckle up, because how many satellites are in the sky right now? Um, I'd like you to guess first. What's your guess? Over a hundred or over um, a million? I'm thinking over a million. No. Um, Try another guess. What do you think? Uh, somebody saying 500? There's there's probably like 5,000 in the sky right now. It's a lot. Um, not all of them are operational. Some of them are not working anymore. Like I said, we can't repair them. So there's about, there's thousands in the sky right now. And there's plans to put many thousands more over the next 10 years. If any of you go in and start working in satellites, it's really interesting. They're getting smaller and smaller down to little cube sizes, called CubeSats and NanoSats, and they're tiny. And uh, lots of them are small, not all, but lots of them are really, really small and we're getting just so, so many. So that was a really great question. And I think I answered the question about how long it takes to build one, which is every engineer loves to talk about that. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and so I guess, do you think now that they're getting smaller and smaller, that's gonna speed up the process or because the parts are so intricate now, do you think that's gonna slow things down a little bit more? No, it speeds it up because actually you're not so worried about it being perfect when you launch it because you didn't spend as much money and you didn't spend as much time, so it's okay. Most of the small ones, they don't live for more than a year or two and then they disintegrate as they fall back down towards the earth. They disintegrate and then they're gone. So that's kind of good as well because we don't have so much space junk. All right. All right, Ms. Bahala, let's see your radar sat model. Can you, oh, there we go. We got good the lighting, good lighting. She's a beauty. You have one of the three sisters. Did there you do three? Cool. Yes, and we are going to make two more. So three sisters. That's so well done. Where did you get the materials to do that? Uh, it is just a paper and then we printed it off the um, Canadian space website. Oh, I'm so happy you did. I would love it if all of you or any of you, once I'm once I'm gone and you're in the room, if all of you can name off the little parts that you see, that you can say, oh, this is the solar panel or this is the bus. The bus is the main body and we call it a bus, but in a way it is a bus. Everything's attached to it. All the superpowers are like attached to that computer system in the bus and it's covered in that shiny foil because it's trying to do a, it's trying to give a thermal balance, right? So that's reflective material. If you can go and find out what the name of the reflective material is, it could be Kevlar, it might be beta cloth. There's different names for different reflective materials. And you can go a little bit further and name off everything that you see. And then the synthetic aperture radar, which is this real superpower and the sensor, being able to name where you see it. Because a lot of kids look at a satellite and they go, yeah, there's all these pieces, I don't know what they are. But it's important to be able to point to the main pieces and say, oh, I know what that is. Okay, yeah. very cool. Love your model. Yeah. Love that. Uh, Mrs. Burns, I see someone right up front with the microphone. You wanna go ahead? Um, My question is, how do you get a satellite up into space? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. How many of you think that we can do that from Canada? No, we can't do that from Canada. We can't launch. No, are you saying yes or no? No. No. 
Right. We can't do it from Canada. We actually have to use other countries launch capability. Um, there's a lot of people talking about wanting to do that from Canada, but it takes a long time to get that going. It's Transport Canada who will make that decision ultimately. So we work with all sorts of companies. For example, the Radar Set Constellation mission, the three little sisters. Can any of you think of a rocket that you've seen in the news that a company that does rockets uh, that might have sent it up for us? SpaceX, I heard you, SpaceX. We looked at all sorts of different companies and we picked one that had the best match for what we needed. And it was out of California. And SpaceX put the three satellites in inside the, the launcher. So you see this big launcher, this rocket looks like a tube. The three satellites were inside and it took off. And it's been a year and a half now. And that was a very successful launch. There's a lot of companies that are providing launches now. It used to be governments and now it's companies. It's changing rapidly. And there's a lot of young students I talked to today who love rockets and launching so much that that's become their expertise. So a lot of Canadian students have become experts in launching and they one day might be able to do that from Canada or they can just work with companies that are, uh, that are abroad. Great question. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes. So give me a wave in your classroom if we should visit your, your class again and get another question. We can squeeze a few more in. All right, I see some waving. Let's start with Madame Melanie. I'll just need you to unmute again for me, Madame. Perfect. Um, because of COVID, are you still building satellites? Oh, that's a really good question. COVID has really changed a lot for, for many of us, but you've probably heard that um, if you're essential, if you're a worker that's essential, you can go in and work on, on your projects and be distanced and wear your mask. So you can imagine engineers are still and technicians are still working on building satellites. Things have slowed down maybe a little bit, but we're still, still finding ways to be able to accomplish our work. And I, I haven't heard that there were delays that were really too, too long. Of course, the most important thing is the health of all of our Canadians. So we are willing to slow down if we need to, right? We don't need to rush. If we need to slow down our, our, our satellite building, that's okay because the health of all of Canada is most, all of Canada, the whole planet is most important right now. So thank you for that question. You're very, very sensitive and thoughtful to ask that. So our Juno Park in Guelph sent me a question via the chat. They're wondering from launch to orbit, how long is it does it take for something like the, uh, you know, the three sisters to be orbiting? Yeah, well, that's good. It's changed a lot it's in the past that it could take days, but now it could take uh, on the order of many hours. Um, give you an example, the space station, which is at 400 kilometers. So that's a height that a lot of satellites go to. The Russians get to the space station within six hours from the time that they launch three astronauts and they go up to the space station. They're there in half a day. It's incredible. Um, satellites, you don't need to rush though. So when you bring satellites up, you usually get into an orbit and you might boost yourself up before you release them. There's no real rush with satellites to, to release them too quickly, but um, it's really under a day. Okay, um, let's go to our other group at Cortland Park. Let's bring them in, there they are. Um, I have a question. Um, are there any uh, astronauts um, and the Canadian Space Agency that are in space now? And if yes, the how many? And also, and, uh, yes. Oh, where, in, where do you make your satellites in Canada? Oh, and, both good questions. All right. And also, my other friend wants to be an engineer like you. Yeah, we're going to need someone. We need engineers, scientists, technicians, data scientists. We need you all. If anybody who's interested, we'd love to have you. So happy to hear that. So first of all, are there astronauts who are in space for the for the Canadian Space Agency right now? No. A year ago, David St. Jock and David St. Jock had been on the space station for six months. So Canada gets a seat up there from time to time. But of course, NASA, Japan, the Europeans, Russians, everyone needs a chance. So we have to distribute the opportunities across. We don't know when the next Canadian will go up. Although I'm gonna guess that the next Canadian that will go up will be Jeremy Hansen. He hasn't had a flight yet and he's up next. And I'm hoping that we'll announce sometime soon that he has an opportunity 
And when they make the announcement, it's usually two years later that they go. They announce that they start their final training. And can you believe final training takes two years? Usually it takes two years. So great question. Then the next question, Joe, help me. What was the second question? Uh, so they're wondering if someone was up. Um, and then if so, how many? And what was the second one? Uh, the second one was, where do you make your satellites in Canada? Yeah, yeah. There's there's lots of small companies doing lots of small satellites. So there's companies all over Canada doing CubeSats and NanoSats. And there's even groups of students doing them in universities. It's incredible. There's people building satellites all over the place. The big satellites for us are often built in saint anne de Bellevue, that is on the island of Montreal, not far from me. Um, it's a company called McDonald, Detweiler & Associates, MDA. You might have parents who work for MDA because uh, a lot of people at the park, their parents work over at the space agency. So the satellites are built on some of the big ones at MDA and some other big satellite makers across Canada, and big companies in Toronto and that as well. All right. Well, uh, Taryn, I hate when this time comes. It always happens. The events go so fast. Uh, and we run out of time. Now, I know there's classrooms who might have some more questions. So, Taryn, would you be okay if maybe they emailed me any more questions and I sent them to yeah, you? Yeah, and I'm going to spend a few minutes over in the chat over here just answering quickly if anybody wants to stay on the chat. Excellent. Well, a huge shout out to the group who joined us today, especially our camera classrooms. It was so good to see everybody. In fact, let's see them one more time. Let's bring them into the call so we get a nice wave out before we go today. Here we go. Groups are coming in. See you later. There we go. I just see so many students. There we go. Well, Taryn, thank you so much. Obviously, it's a blast to have you joining us and sharing with us. Uh, you know, Canada's amazing work in space, especially with our satellite systems uh, and all the amazing things they do for us on planet Earth. For those who can join us a little bit later, we're going live again at 2.30 and we're going to have this event en français. So it should be a great time. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Taryn, a huge thank you. And uh, we'll see everybody in a bit. Thanks so much, great. everyone. Bye, everyone.